Hello and a very warm welcome back to another episode of the Liz Our Wellbeing Show. Now I have just been joined down the line by leading surgeon and hair loss expert Dr. Greg Williams. Greg works from the Harley Street's Fargo Hair Institute, where he specializes in cutting edge hair restoration treatments. From hormones to genetics, he has shared the reasons why we find ourselves losing our locks and what steps we can all take to prevent and treat this confidence knocking condition. Be sure to stay tuned to the end of the episode where Greg stresses the urgent need for stricter regulations in the hair restoration industry and shares his top tips on how to spot reputable practitioners. Do please share this information far and wide and join me on Instagram of the show. I would love to hear your thoughts on all that you are about to hear. So without further ado, let's hear from Dr. Williams. So Dr. Greg, welcome to my podcast. It's a real pleasure to have you. Thank you for joining us virtually. Um, Can we start with a little bit about your background? Because you are obviously a plastic surgeon, which has been a very highbrow, and you're working in hair loss. So what's, what's your journey and what's so fascinating about hair and hair loss? So it's been a, a already quite a long journey. I originally hail from the West Indies, um, from Jamaica. I was educated at uh, boarding school and university in Canada. I went back and did medical school in, in, in Jamaica and then came to the UK to do my surgical um, training and uh, started off as general surgeon, specialized in plastic surgery and then subspecialized in burn surgery. So um, for nine years, I was the um, a burns cons- consultant at Chelsea Westminster Hospital, which is the only burn service in London. Um, I was a clinical lead there. Mm-hmm. And in fact, I was in charge of burns in the southeast of England. Um, and people who get burnt, burnt their hairy bits. So their scalps and eyebrows, mustaches, beards and other areas. And that's where my interest in, in hair restoration originally came from. And I have to say the techniques for surgical hair restoration that I was uh, taught by my mentors um, was not dissimilar to what was done in the days of <laughs> the Second World War. Uh, they were pretty archaic. So I went off and, uh, and trained myself um, in Brazil and, and Canada with experts there, really for reconstructive uh, hair restoration. But the techniques the same as for um, aesthetic um uh, hair restoration for for genetic hair loss and and other things um and so that's where it all came from and i went into full-time private practice about eight years ago that is really completely fascinating what an extraordinary journey and do you still have connections with your medics and your and your sort of burns connections or is that something that's that's sort of long gone no huge connections um uh I um, am the medical trustee on a, on a charity called Dan's Fund for Burns, which is very dear to my heart. Um, I won't spend a lot of time talking about it, but uh, it's, uh, there, there's a lack of peer support once you leave hospital with a big burn. That's what we provide along with financial assistance. I'm also um, part of a pro bono uh, partnership with the Katie Piper Foundation. So we provide f- free hair transplant surgery to um, deserving individuals who can't afford it, um, who have uh, burn scar, hair loss. Um, amazing. Well, that, that's going to have to be a whole other podcast, I think. <laughs> In the meantime, I'll definitely make sure that we put all the details for those resources at the end of the podcast, because that's fascinating. And that's also something that, um, that is, is close to my heart as well for various reasons. So thank you for connecting on that level. So moving on then to hair loss, let's talk about that. How can we If we go back to basics, how do we tell the difference between normal shedding, which we all do when you brush your hair and you look at the hairbrush and you see hairs, and something that's a bit more problematic? So, Liz, I'm just going to spin that around and ask you a question, first of all, because when when we talk about hair loss, it's very easy to to have one idea in our head. Uh, But the first thing is, are we talking about male or female pattern hair loss? Because they are completely different. Ooh. So, do you want to? Fo- is your do you want is your audience mostly uh, female? Do you want to focus on female hair loss, or do you want to keep it general, or or how do you want to do it? We're definitely very female focused, and we are midlife women by in in the majority and beyond. Not to exclude our lovely male listeners, because of course we do have many of those as well. So, shall we start with a focus on female? Because I think that is the thing that tends to be a little bit less talked about. Um, and then can we throw in something for the guys towards the end, perhaps, just so that everybody's happy? Absolutely. 
Um, and uh, and that makes it much harder for me because male hair loss is really, really, really easy to talk about. Okay. Male hair loss is so, so complicated. So for the men I see, um, I, don't, I don't do any blood tests. Uh, but it's a very basic medical history form. For the women I see, I actually won't see them without them having a series of blood tests and filling out a, a medical history form because the causes of female hair loss um, are, are, are variable. Um, and as you know, um, hormones, fluctuations, so the oral contraceptive pill, HRT, menopause, uh, pregnancy, these all have huge effects on, on, on female um, hair uh, volume and quality and, and amount. Um, so how do we know if, if as you say, uh, a bit of shedding is normal? Well, we have about 100,000 hairs on our head uh, in the average uh, individual, and we lose about 100 of those a day but we gain a hundred a day. So the hairs are in a cycle, a life cycle, where they're growing, they're resting, they're shedding. Um, and so if we lose a uh, hundred hairs uh, through shedding, we expect a hundred hairs to be growing and that keeps the hair volume in balance. Mm -hmm. But if you're losing more hair than you're, um, than you're gaining every day, then you have, uh, uh, then you have results in, in loss and, and, and thinning. And there's so many causes for that. Mm. Um, of course, the, the, the common ones are female hair loss, um, just genetic female hair loss. But there's something called telogen effluvium. So um, anytime you have a, tr a, a trauma um, that can be physical um, or uh, an illness or emotional or psychological, a bereavement, for instance, you can often see shedding about three or four months down the line. Really? That's fascinating because I have heard of stories and i never know whether they are real of of people who had an, a major trauma or a life event and all their hair fell out very real it's real my goodness so what causes that then what would make that happen is that the release of cortisol or stress or what's what's going on and this is where i'm going to be really really embarrassed is because we just don't know we there's so much about female hair loss and I, when i say we i mean the international expert community there's just so much we don't understand um, so what's really topical at the moment is, is what we are calling COVID hair loss. Um, and there, there are a large number of reports of, of hair loss from people who've had COVID. What's not clear is if it's just like the hair loss you can get after any severe illness or if it's something specific to COVID. But, you know, we're, we're starting to hear about the, the long haul um, COVID sufferers and a lot of them do have hair loss. That is just so extraordinary. Now, you talked then when we were talking about shock and stress and losing your hair, uh, you mentioned women. Is it, is it only something that happens to women through shock and stress or, or does that happen to yeah. guys? Guys go bald overnight too. Um, so it's not that, that women go bald. Um, it's that, they, uh, that they, they, they shed a lot of hair. Mm -hmm. um, and that's called um, telogen effluvium, uh, you know, similar to what happens after pregnancy or breastfeeding. Yeah. Well, I, I, I was told, well, you know, when I lost hair after, after having my, my, my babies, that actually I wasn't losing additional hair. It was just that during pregnancy and breastfeeding, you stop the shedding. And therefore, you know, when you, when you come out of all that and your hormones settle, all the hair that you would have lost, you're then losing, which is why it looks so much more. Is that true or not? Um, not entirely certain. Um, at the end of the day, um, I'll just be honest, you know, I'm a surgeon. I put the hair back in. Um, I'm not, a, I'm not a, a dermatologist who specializes in hair loss or for that matter, a diagnostician. So when I have somebody with scalp or hair problems, I refer them to my dermatology um, colleague who, who makes the diagnosis and treats. Mm -hmm. um, but we do know, you know, the majority of women who, who, who do get pregnant do say that their hair looks and feels better and feels thicker. And then afterwards, uh, not so. And some recover. And actually, there are lots of stories of women who feel that their hair loss was not as good as before they got pregnant. But I just want to go back to when you were talking about the stories of people going completely bald overnight. Um, that uh, is usually something called alopecia areata. A lot of people commonly re refer to that as alopecia. The term alopecia means hair loss. And so um, they're all forms of different, uh, different forms of alopecia. So um, male pattern hair loss is androgenetic alopecia. When you have a burn, that's scarring alopecia. There are dermatological conditions. Um, uh, we can talk about one of those, which is important for middle-aged women called frontal fibrosing alopecia. We must come back to that. 
but alopecia areata is where you get little patches of, of round areas of hair loss, but then you can get all the hair on your head going. That's called alopecia totalis. And in fact, you can lose all the hair on your body and that's called alopecia universalis. And, um, and obviously that, that can, can be devastating. And we, we don't, it's an autoimmune condition, which again, we don't fully understand why it happens. They're not really any good. There's no cure. There are some treatments, but they're only effective while you use the treatments. Um, and there's a support group, which is Alopecia UK, that has you know thousands and thousands of members. It's a really common problem. That is just extraordinary, isn't it? It's making me very grateful for you know every little hair on my body to think that it's it's hanging on in there and that you know something could trigger and, and the whole lot gone. I think the psychological impact, presumably for women, is massive. You must see a lot of that of, of women coming in absolute despair. I know a lot of letters that we get from readers and listeners and viewers in absolute desperation. Please, please help me. I've, I've lost my hair. I, I feel that I, I can almost no longer function without my hair. I, I think there's just one word that that I can use, and, and that's devastating. Absolutely devastating. Now, what most women don't realize is from about the age of 25 to 30, your hair starts to deteriorate. And you don't notice it really until quite a lot's gone. So maybe a mid-40s. And then around uh, menopause, there's a second hit. And that's when people really notice it. Um, you know, ponytails, women who wear ponytails will say, well, my ponytail is just not as thick as it was. Right. So why, you know, why do you think most older women have short hairstyles? Yeah. It's because it is natural that the hair, you can no longer have a longer hairstyle that you used to have when you were younger because you just don't have the hair volume. That's normal. But I agree with you. It's just not talked about that much. It's not really out there in the public domain. Mm. Clearly, you know, when we're talking about midlife women and beyond and we're looking at hormonal changes, you know, menopause is responsible for so many things, which brings us always back to estrogen. But maybe there's a testosterone link as well going on. We know that women produce actually more testosterone in their ovaries than they do estrogen. So and all of these hormones decline during perimenopause and, and beyond. What's the hormonal connection there? And, and will replacing hormones with something like HRT be helpful? I'm going to go back to embarrassing myself and my profession to say, you know, we still really don't know. We commonly refer to female hair loss as androgenic alopecia, um, really until fairly recently. I've stopped doing that um, because we're not certain that it is actually male hormone driven. We know that certain conditions that have high male hormones like polycystic ovarian syndrome um, will definitely cause hair loss, but we're not certain that the common type of female hair loss um, is really male hormone driven mm. or is it to do with the balance of female and male hormones or is it more female hormone related but the common um, pattern of female hair loss is a a thinning of the of the central part and then an oval um, shaped deterioration of hair on the top of the head luckily for most women yeah. different from men they retain a hairline of reasonable density. And that can be used with creative hairstyling to cover the thinning behind, uh, behind that hairline. But then um, as that thinning gets worse and worse, it's harder to hide. In fact, just yesterday, an, an old dear friend of mine texted me, I haven't spoken to her in a couple of years, and she, she said, oh my God, uh, Greg, I'm, I'm losing my hair, what can I do? And actually a photograph from the top that she sent wasn't too bad but it was the, the straight on view where the hairline was just really, really see-through and she's devastated. Yeah. So are there different conditions then? Is that how you use that diagnostic tool, if you like, visually to see whether the hair is, is being lost from the back, like a kind of, you know, male, typical male kind of bald patch at the top or going back from the front and receding? Yeah, so, so I, I generally refer to hair loss in women as female hair loss. Um, but that there are different patterns. So the, the, the common female pattern hair loss is that oval area on the top of the head that just expands and expands and expands. But then there's a male pattern, um, which is uh, to get uh, loss in the temples. And that's incredibly common. And so you'll find a lot of women will wear um, a fringe, uh, to, to, to cover that um, and not want to pull their hair back like you're currently doing because they've got those temple recessions which yeah. look masculine. 
So you don't have that. So you're able to pull your hair back, but a lot of women won't do that. And actually that's a, you know, we'll talk about hair transplant surgery later, but that's a fabulous indication for, for, for hair transplantation because generally the hair volume on the rest of the hair is good. So we've got a good donor supply. Yes. They're not at risk of a lot of further hair loss and we can fill in those gaps in the temples. But there is one condition that I want your listeners to be very aware of that we don't understand. It's called frontal fibrosing alopecia, abbreviated FFA. And it is becoming almost epidemic in its um, frequency now. Uh, in middle-aged, um, perimenopausal, mostly Caucasian women. And a lot of women think, oh, I'm just losing my hair from female hair loss. And it's not. It's an autoimmune condition where your body's immune system attacks the hairs and the hairline recedes. But not only the hairline, but the sideburns go. So the hair at the sides go the, um, and, the, and the hairline above the forehead. But quite commonly, the eyebrows go as well. Um, and whilst we can't cure it, if we catch it early, we can usually control it. So stop further progression. And, uh, and that's something that, that women really need to be aware about. But most genes won't recognize it. Most dermatologists, in fact, won't recognize it. Wow. There are only a few dermatologists in the country who super specialize in hair. So quite often this goes undiagnosed for long periods of time. And, it, and it's a real shame. And how does it get treated? Is it, is it straightforward to treat? Uh, it's, it's usually with, with oral, um, medications, yeah. with, with, with drugs, um, that have side effects. So you got to balance, you know, am I willing to take the risk of these side effects to maintain my hair? And that's why you need, uh, a, a really, you need a specialist who, yeah. who deals with this frequently, who, who can diagnose and treat and follow up. That's really, really good to, to hear and for people to be aware of, to catch these things early. Can I come back to the hormone side of things? Because I know a lot of people, of women who, if they are able to get testosterone, and that's a whole other story about the, the struggle for women to, to be prescribed testosterone. Um, but if they do, and when they start rubbing it on, if they keep rubbing it on the same spot repeatedly for, for you know, every day for months and months, they begin to see hair growth. So could we then, in theory, get hold of a load of testosterone gel and rub it on our, our thinning heads and see hair growth? So you're asking me a question that's really out of my field of expertise, so I'm not <laughs> going to answer that. What I will say that it is quite a, sh a shocking situation that in, you know, where we are in 2020, we only have one licensed treatment for female hair loss, and that is topical minoxidil marketed as regain for women yeah um and and can you believe that that is the and, and we're not even you know and a lot of women it's not actually that effective either i mean it, you know it's, it's certainly worth trying and yeah. if you're going to use it you have to use it consistently you know this is every day for at least a year and what you're really hoping to do is is to hold on to the hair rather than see you know it's called regain i don't think it's a great name um because uh really what we want to do is to hold on to uh, the hair. Yeah. Uh, in, in fact, um, I'm just going to plug in my um, charger because I'm afraid of the scene it's going to go and I would hate for us to get <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> While you do that, can I ask you, because obviously I, I'm aware of, of Regain and, and Minoxidil and these sort of hair treatments that you, you don't need to get a prescription for. You can just go into the high street chemist and, and buy them. Is there any difference between the Regain or the Minoxidil that's marketed for men and women or is that just a marketing thing? It's it's pretty much a marketing thing. Um, there are uh, two strengths generally used, 2% and 5%. And uh, previously, the 2% only came as a liquid, um, and women put it on twice a day, um, whereas men use the 5% twice a day. And more in the last uh, five or six years, uh, the 5% foam uh, has been licensed for women to use once a day, and it's a lot more user-friendly. One of the side effects of, of, of topical minoxidil, though, is um, what's called hypertrichosis, so excessive uh, hair growth, uh, particularly uh, facial hair growth. So for women, for men, that might be quite exciting as a side effect. Um, for women, it's not. Um, so, so again, that's something that women need to be aware of. Now, yeah. minoxidil was originally um, used uh, and still is used as an anti-hypertensive and anti-high blood pressure treatment. And that's how we found out it was good for hair, you know, over two decades ago. And the topical preparation was developed. 
there's now actually been a resurgence in the interest of using oral minoxidil, the pill, to treat hair loss at a fraction of the high blood pressure dose. Uh, but it's not licensed. But again, specialist um, uh, hair interested dermatologists will prescribe oral minoxidil. That's interesting and presumably just much easier and, and rather than having to rub on a foam or a liquid once or twice a day. It is. But sadly, again, we don't know exactly how it works. Um, whilst we're on that, there are other off-license oral treatments for female hair loss um, that tend to, f- most of them are, are, have anti-androgen, so anti-male hormone components. So spironolactone, which is a diuretic, is commonly used to treat female hair loss. And whilst uh, finasteride, which is the uh, effective treatment for male hair loss, is not licensed in women because of the risk of birth defects, it is prescribed to um, women who are um, perimenopausal or are certain they're not going to get pregnant. Um, and it can be quite effective, but we think it's effective in those women whose hair loss is caused by male hormones. Obviously, it's an anti-male hormone drug. It's not going to be effective if the male hormones aren't the problem. But I just say, again, you know, it, there is so much research going into this, and there has been for decades, and we still don't have the answers. We still don't know. What about nutritional supplements? I'm seeing an increasing array of often extremely expensive supplements that say they're, you know, specially formulated. They often contain things like biotin and silica. Well, what's your view? Are they, are they going to do anything? How, how can they specifically feed follicles? Is that helpful or not? So a couple of years ago, I did a really extensive review on, on the nutritional supplements available, and there are literally hundreds of them in the UK. Um, and you'll see them on the sides of buses, uh, you know, huge um, marketing campaigns endorsed by well-known celebrities. Um, and a lot of them say scientifically proven. Actually, if you, do, if you look at the research, it's not there. There is no nutritional supplement. Um, that will increase uh, the amount of hair you have, unless you've got deficiencies. Now, of course, if you have deficiencies, then you want to make sure that you're, um, that they are returned to normal levels. So there are things that are really important for hair, such as iron. That's really, really important. And actually, quite often, um, if you have a blood test, um, it can be within the normal range um, that's quoted from the labs and your GP may think is normal, but for hair, we like it to be higher than normal. So one of those tests we do is called ferritin and we like our ferritin levels to be over 70. Zinc's important. Vitamin D is important. Um, protein, terribly, terribly important. And, uh, you know, your whole nu- nutritional, um, balance is important. Hydration, um, obviously, you know, like anything else, looking after your general health exercise, not smoking, these sorts of things are all important, but we don't, um, as, as far as I am aware, um, there are no nutritional supplements um, that have been proven to treat hair loss. There is a, a common one that a lot of people um, do like, which is called Viviscal. Um, they've done a huge amount of research. They've spent a lot of money, but it's really hard to do good quality research in hair, unfortunately. But it takes um, too long to grow, doesn't it? And there's so many other factors. But interestingly, just as you were ticking off all the list of important nutrients, I was thinking that people who are mostly plant-based eating or vegan or vegetarian potentially could be at risk then if you're looking at higher, higher than usual iron levels. And we know that iron levels, particularly in women, can be low. And your fat-soluble vitamins like vitamin D um, and your zinc, you know, these, these can be lower in those who are focused on plant-based eating. So maybe supplements. I mean, you say that, but then, you know, do you have a lot of vegetarians and vegans walking around with, with, with thinning hair? Not necessarily. Do you have a lot of, you know, people who are, um, you know, have, have, um, very good diets having hair loss? Yes. So -hmm. that's again, where we come back to, to saying, you know, there's so much we, we just don't understand. Yeah, and fats presumably useful, essential fatty acids. Not something that I really focus on when I'm speaking to my patients. No, it's mostly about the proteins and the vitamins. Protein, okay, right. Well, that's good. We'll make sure we'll, we'll get a, a, a wide balance. What about hair styling? So I'm, I'm, you know, I'm thinking before we move on to the the real sort of hardcore surgical uh, answers. I'm trying to think of things that we could perhaps you know look at or consider. Um, as first steps. I hear quite a bit about traction hair loss. 
And particularly in some um, women who may style their hair in braids, so they're pulling their hair back all the time, or the, the so-called Croydon ponytail, where you scrape your hair back into a high, high ponytail and, and, and pull on the hair a lot. Is, is that going to cause permanent damage? Absolutely, yes. Um, it's particularly common in black women with Afro-textured hair. Um, a lot of the time with black women wearing wigs, it's to cover um, the areas on the sides um, of the head that have been lost. There was, uh, I think it was back in 2010, um, there were a, a lot of pictures famously of Naomi Campbell um, suffering from the condition. But we see it also in Sikh men who wear tight hairstyles um, uh, for religious reasons and tight turbans. We see it in ballet dancers who, who um, uh, regularly pull their hair back. And as you say, any any um, tight hairstyle or um, or braiding can cause hair loss. Uh, it can be reversible if it's if it's if you stop the practice uh, early, but it is also a fantastic indication for hair transplant surgery because it's a finite condition. Usually, the rest of the hair is fine, and you're just filling in the areas that have lost hair. Yeah. Um, but in terms of of other styling um, practices. Nothing's really going to change the amount of hair, um, but it's the quality of the hair. So mm -hmm. heat damage, chemical damage, that can all cause breakage mm. um, uh, and reduce hair volume. But actually, the number of hairs per centimeter squared on the scalp isn't necessarily going to change. Okay. What about standing on your head? You know, I mean, in encouraging blood flow, doing our, you know, our down face dog or our, our yoga headstands. Is that going to be helpful, do you think? I do lots of yoga and you can see I have very thick hair and I haven't had Ooh, I don't know how much of that is transplanted though, do I? <laughs> <laughs> no, sadly, uh, hanging upside down is not going to um, improve the amount of hair you have. It's interesting because we, we don't think that decreased scalp blood flow is a component of hair uh, of uh, causing hair loss but we don't know that for certain we know that minoxidil um regain mm. does increase blood flow but we're not certain that's actually the mechanism that by which it, it works um there's been a renewed interest um recently i've been approached by several companies about radio frequency devices mm. that suggest they're increasing blood flow and my point to them is okay well you can demonstrate these devices increase blood flow but why do you think that that is doing anything for hair loss yeah um Interesting. Uh, so I guess the same would be the true of, of things like massage. You know, head, I was just going to say that. A lot of people um, think that, you know, regular scalp massage will, will help with your hair. And maybe it will and maybe it won't. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> so let's get on to the things, uh, the more kind of high tech things that are definitely making a difference. And I read, as I'm sure so many of my, my listeners and viewers do, you know, in the back of Sunday supplements, you know, pages and pages of ads for hair loss and talking about all sorts of gadgets, things like um, lasers and you know, we've talked about pills, but surgery, transplantations. Talk us through the kind of the step by step, perhaps starting with the, the less invasive procedures that, that might have an effect and then moving up to, to the actual transplants. Yeah, so we've got the non-surgical, non-invasives, the non-surgical invasives, and then the surgical. Um, so the, the, the non-surgical, non-invasives are things like low level light therapy. So laser caps. They have in-office devices where you have to, you pay a lot of money and you go to somebody's office and sit under a hood for, uh, you know, every every couple of days for weeks and months, and um, it's very inconvenient. But there are home devices, and I think there is logic to these. We know that hairs have light receptors. We know that in petri dishes, certain wavelengths of light will um, encourage hair growth, and we know that in certain individuals who use these devices there is demonstrable improvement. What we don't have is good research-based evidence like we have for topical minoxidil or oral finasteride in men. We don't have that good evidence for low-level light therapy, but it is something I mentioned to, to, to my patients as an option. Mm, so that, that would be sort of intense LED style, style lights, so would it? It's, it's, it's light, um, what the devices currently used are light in the, in the red light range. Mm -hmm. um, that can be the lasers or light emitting diodes. Mm -hmm. uh, but the light has to get through any hair that's there, through the skin, 
down to the depth where the cell, uh, the, the components of the, the, the cells are that need to be affected. And we think what the light does is stimulate what's called the mitochondria, which is the energy producing parts of the cells to produce more protein and, and improve the quality of the hair. So that's one low level light therapy. It's certainly worth thinking about. There are a number of devices on the market from cheap knockoff ones from China to very expensive, sophisticated ones that talk to you. You can play your radio, your music through, tells you when to turn on and turn off. Um, so there are a whole range. Um, and I really can't endorse any of them because we don't have the evidence. Yeah. Okay. Um, so so m moving on from those, then we've got the yeah. ones that are, are invasive. Yeah. So, so things like uh, mesotherapy and injections of various products. Um, and PRP, platelet-rich plasma, you'll have heard of that. So yes. taking um, some of your sample of your blood, spinning it down, extracting the platelets, which are filled with growth factors and injecting them. Again, there's a lot of logic to it, but the evidence, the solid evidence, the reproducible research-based evidence isn't there yet. Yeah. Um, it so, seems promising, uh, doesn't it? I mean, I've, I've, I've read some quite good reports of people who've had this PRP where they, they take their own plasma and, and spin it out, as you say, and, and inject it back. Yeah, the question is, with, with any of these um, uh, non-surgical invasive procedures, is, is it just the needling itself that's doing, <laughs> that's doing the benefit? So you're, you're providing microtrauma, yeah. um, you're stimulating the cells, maybe stimulating the blood flow or collagen production, or we don't know, so much cell-to-cell um, conversations that go on within the skin and the hair follicle. Mm -hmm. We don't really understand any of that properly. And maybe it's just the, the needling and you could, you know, put anything in and it might work in some people. But why, do, why does it work in some people and not others? That's what we don't understand. I'm sure it does work in some people, but to spend a lot of money for something that may not work, um, I would suggest put your money where, um, where you know it's going to work. And, and that's really with hair transplant surgery. Mm -hmm. um, for the right, for the right, indications in the right person at the right time yep. um it's really really effective so so talk us through then how how do you know if you're a, a good candidate and then if you are a good candidate what how, how would it work and what would you expect so the first thing is is having an accurate diagnosis um and the second thing ideally is having um stability to the hair loss so if you're in a phase of of hair of rapid hair loss and you're putting hair back in with transplantation then you're not necessarily going to get a net improvement. What you want to do is build a transplant on a stable foundation. So you have hair, you add to it, so it looks thicker. Mm -hmm. um, whereas if you have hair and you add to it and you lose your native hair, you might look no different and be very disappointed, although you'd be better than had you done nothing. Mm -hmm. so, um, so that's the first thing. Um, ideally, to be on, on a form of treatment that is stabilizing the hair if it hasn't stabilized naturally. And then um, having realistic expectations. That's really, really important. Then we've got to assess uh, the area that needs to be covered versus the donor area availability because the hair has to be taken from somewhere to be moved. Um, we'll, we'll talk briefly a little later on about cloning where that we may have an infinite supply of hair, but at the moment we don't. So we've got a finite supply that we need to move. And there are two ways. Generally, it's taken in men, certainly, it's taken from the sides and back of the head. In women, it depends on their, 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 their diagnosis. Most women with, with female hair loss will actually have hair loss at the sides of the head as well, above the ears. And so you're limited to a small donor area at the back of the head, which means quite often you can't address the full area of the female hair loss. And you need to focus either maybe on the part line or that central thinning bit at the front. So you get a, a visible improvement, but still needing to to use creative hairstyles to to cover other areas of thinning. So and, uh, are you literally sort of scooping out a hair follicle and root and bit of skin and, and sticking it on a different part of the scalp? Or are you taking out whole sections of skin, you know, sort of half a centimetre or whatever, and then re-stitching that to your scalp? So, well done. <laughs> Those are the, basic, <laughs> the, the, two, the two basic techniques in very kind of layman's terms, but, <laughs> or laywoman's terms. Um, so your hair grows naturally on the head in little groupings called follicular units. It's like a little family that comes out of one orifice that may have one, two, three, or four hairs. And when we move that uh, little unit of hairs, we put it in an individual hole and we call that a graft, the follicular unit graft. And generally we put the single hairs at the front for, for natural, uh, a natural appearance of the hairline and then the, the higher groupings further back for density. 
So there are two ways to extract the hairs. One's called follicular unit excision, FUE, and it's the current com uh, popular technique in men where you shave the donor area and you drill out the little families, as you say. It leaves you with a little round hole, leaves you with a little round scar, and you can have thousands of those round scars. But in men, they can hair hide those scars with a short haircut. Uh, the other technique uh, that we have is called the, the strip technique, uh, which, as I was saying, involves uh, cutting a strip of skin out and then dissecting it into the little individual groupings under microscopes, and injecting that, uh, sorry, implanting those into the little holes. Uh, that's what most women will have. Um, there are techniques where you can do the FUE drilling out um, method without shaving the head, but they're quite complicated ways to do it. You can increase the damage rate when you're extracting the hairs. It's not something I currently offer, um, but it is an option. The other option for women, if they want to have, if they don't want to have a big cut, is to shave a rectangular area of the of the scalp, drill out the hairs, and then let the hair fall back down, so you can hide the shaved area. That limits the number of hairs that can be extracted. But those are the two main techniques, FUE and what's called a strip follicular unit transplant, strip FUT or linear um, strip excision technique. And are they guaranteed to work if you, if you take out your hairs and transplant them? Are they definitely going to take, or is it like a seedling in a greenhouse? It might take or it might not. No, no, there are no guarantees in, in surgery. And, and what we need to be very clear, a lot of people who come in for a hair transplant think it's a bit like, laser hair removal, a bit of a day at the spa. This is real surgery with real risks and real complications, and there are no guarantees. Uh, but I would expect about 90% of the transplanted hairs to grow if we're implanting them into healthy skin. A little bit different if we're talking about scars or some dermatological conditions, but about 90% of the hairs I'd expect to grow. And presumably this is done under some kind of anesthetic. So it's local anesthetic. You're awake during the whole procedure um, when I do it. Um, you have uh, the benefit of some oral sedation with some Valium, which tends to relax and, and make life seem quite good um, whilst it's being done. And, and quite often my patients will sleep through the procedures, but they're long procedures. They can be six, eight, 10 hours long, uh, a bit like a long flight to, to Australia, maybe um, reclining for most of it, watching movies, snoozing. Um, we used to provide uh, our patients with uh, with, with snacks and meals, but now with COVID, we have to, you have to, like the airlines, bring your own. <laughs> Goodness. And for you as a surgeon doing this, is it a bit like, I mean, I can imagine it being incredibly mindful, almost like crafting a, a you know, really complicated jigsaw puzzle or, or doing a tapestry, or, or it must be incredibly satisfying to, because to, you presumably see the end result immediately as soon as you finished. Actually, no, you get a little bit of a preview but the transplanted hairs tend to fall out after two to three weeks and they don't grow. They grow into a resting phase for three, they, they sit in a resting phase for three to four months and then they start to grow as a fine hair and it takes about four months of growth to see anything. You know, your hair only grows a centimeter a month normally. So at about eight months, you're starting to see the result, but it takes a year and a half to see the full result. So it's a long, long wait. It is immensely satisfying when those patients do come back and the number of times I've been told, you know, yesterday I had a typical patient, male patient who says, you know, he always used to wear his hair brushed forward. He didn't have a lot of confidence. He says it has just transformed his life. But also in, in other ways, he now exercises more. He eats better. He dresses better. All because he feels better about his hair. And that's the same for, for women. I do hope you are enjoying the show and I'm just pausing here for a moment to let my new listeners know that we have a very special subscriber offer for the Lizal Wellbeing magazine, which is now exclusively and only available on subscription. This is good news because we can bring it to you with a saving and free UK PMP. We can even send it further afield with overseas postage just paid at cost. So how does it work? Well, you simply head to lizellwellbeing.com forward slash lizellpod to enjoy six issues for the price of five. So that's lizellwellbeing.com forward slash lizellpod and you will get six issues just for the price of five and the free UK PMP. So without further ado, let's get back to the second half of the show. So we were just, uh, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the, the black market that exists in hair transplant surgery, because you might be surprised to know that there is no training in hair transplant surgery in any medical curriculum. So you don't get taught it in medical school. 
and you don't get taught it when you specialize in plastic surgery or dermatology. There is no training available in the UK in hair transplant surgery. Worse yet, there's no qualification required to perform it. Um, and uh, basically, anybody can do it. Really? Um, and, yeah. Um, and, uh, and it's seen by many doctors as, as easy and lucrative. Um, and, and neither is, is actually that, that, that true. It, it is to do it well and to do it consistently well is very hard. Now, it's a bit like playing tennis. Anybody can pick up a tennis ball and hit it over the net. But if you want to play well, um, it takes a lot of, um, a lot of experience and a lot of training. Yeah. Um, and so people have to uh, be very careful who they go to. So what should we be looking out for? What kind of qualifications and questions should we be asking? So uh, these days, you know, all the websites have look beautiful and they're glossy with endorsements um, and lots of before and after pictures that look great. But there are lots of brokers out there, middlemen. So be very wary of any website that doesn't have uh, the ex uh, explicit um, uh, say exactly who the doctors are and what their qualifications and experience are. Yeah. Um, now, the next thing is that a lot of hair transplant clinics are fronted or run by non-doctors. So you'll get all the advice and the planning from a non-doctor. Don't let that happen. You must meet the doctor who's going to do it prior to the day of surgery. And that doctor should explain to you the number of grafts they're going to do, the hairline design, and the donor harvesting method. Um, all, uh, and also, there is a trend these days for with the FUE technique, which certainly in men is a more popular technique, but many clinics only offer that, so they'll offer that to women as well, for the surgery to be delegated to non-doctors. So the drilling out of the hairs is handed over to technicians who have no medical qualifications. Oh. So at the qualification, you must ask who is going to be doing my hair extraction. And at the time of surgery, when you've had a bit of Valium and all is feeling good, you must turn around and see who's actually operating on the back of your head. Oh, um, no, really? And, sure it's a doctor. Uh, and, and the doctor who, who said it was gonna, who was gonna do it on you. And then lastly, all uh, hair transplant clinics and also all facilities where the hair transplants are done in England must be CQC registered, Care Quality Commission registered, and the same in the devolved nations. And those are sort of the four main highlighted things that I, I think are, are, are being abused uh, these days. Gosh, that is, that is a real shocker. And what sort of costs are involved? I mean, what, what, sort, what ballpark region are we talking about for transportation? The ballpark, you're talking 3,000 to 10,000 per procedure. And procedures sometimes need to be repeated to increase the density uh, because there's a limit to what you can achieve in one procedure. It's usually about a third of the thickness of your thicker hair if you're bald. And so that may need to be thickened up with a repeat procedure. Sometimes you don't have enough hair available in one procedure to do the, air, the full area in men, for instance, but also in women. So you might need to uh, come back and do an area you haven't done in the first procedure. Mm -hmm. And then in fu if future hair loss um, uh, gaps open up, then you may want to come back and address those areas which weren't apparent at the first procedure. So years down the line. So how often would you space out those procedures if you had to have two or three sessions? Would, would you be like a year apart or would you be able so to? Certainly a year. Um, but as I said, it takes about a year and a half to see the full result. So if you're going back to transplant in the same area, it makes sense to see the full result. Mm -hmm. um, having said that, um, for, for uh, uh, one indication we didn't talk about for women um, is lowering a hairline. So a lot of women who, have, who are born with high hairlines want to lower them. That's a great indication for hair transplantation, but uh, because of the density limitation that can be achieved per procedure, I certainly will say to women, you, you, you know, this needs to be two procedures with the cost that goes with two procedures. And if we have that predetermined plan, then I'll often do the second one at about a year. Mm, very interesting. And is there any advantage in doing it earlier? You know, thinking of younger men, perhaps you've got very strongly receding hairlines. And so this is a, this is a really, and, until they've lost a bit more or should they just kind of jump in? Yeah, this is a really big kind of misconception that people have that hair transplantation in some way is treating the hair loss. It's not. Um, it's filling in the gap. So if you take a young man in his mid to late 20s whose father and grandfather both completely bald and he's starting thinning and you put his hairline where he wants it to be at 25, which is where you know it was when he was 19. And then he goes on to lose the hair that his father and grandfather have lost. He will look ridiculous in the future and there won't be enough hair to cover that. Oh, so no. 
you know, the hardest part of my job as a hair transplant surgeon is trying to predict how much hair loss an individual is going to have in their lifetime and planning their transplant for that eventuality. So the older somebody is, the more accurate your prediction is going to be. Right. So what is a ballpark age then you would say would be sensible to come and talk to you? Any age. Um, because what we want to do is start talking about the things we can do to stabilize the hair. And so in men, uh, starting monotonous and finasteride early is really important. And that might actually prevent them ever needing a hair transplant. Now, unfortunately, with finasteride, we won't, you know, we can maybe talk another time um, about male hair loss because that's a huge subject. Yeah. Um, there are side effects with finasteride that are putting a lot of men off. Um, and so it, there are a lot of factors we, we, uh, I use to predict whether people are going to lose a lot of hair, how early it started, how rapidly it's progressing, what the family history is like, and also what their hair looks like. Quite often you can see it deteriorating subtly over a wide area. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and that will um, help influence when we do it and what we do. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you always want to err on the, on the cautious side, leave donor hair available. Um, while we're on that subject, though, one exciting um, thing that's uh, becoming available, you'll, you'll have heard a lot about um, cloning and stem cells. Yes. So um, I, I work with an organization where we have the world's first hair bank. So much like uh, people freeze their baby's umbilical cord blood in the hope that one day you'll be able to use the stem cells to cure cancer and all sorts of other diseases, we are banking and freezing hair. Uh, They're not quite stem cells. They're called dermal papilla cells. And the idea um, is that we will be able to thaw them out, expand them in the lab, and re-inject them into the scalp at this point in time, not necessarily to grow new hair, but to rejuvenate deteriorating hair. So um, in in women with thinning hair, perhaps we will be able to cause that, make that hair grow stronger by injecting these cells. So we're we got um, obviously put back a bit by, by the COVID situation, but we're hoping we are currently banking the, the, the cells and we're hoping to be injecting um, sometime in, in 2021. That's really fascinating. So if you're somebody who's, who's having hair loss issues now, could you come in and have your stem cells banked for a future treatment? Is, is, is that the idea? Yeah, it is. Um, I mean, it's still... It's still um, it's still uh, obviously unproven, um, but the, 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 we're back to us by some really, really good science. Um, mm. There are new ways in which we, we, we've been growing hair cells in the lab and inject them for, for decades, but there is some new technology in how we're growing them. So growing them in little spheres instead of in flat sheets um, that we think is, is going to make the crucial difference. Gosh. It's just all so fascinating, isn't it? So we are going to, at the end of this podcast, put up all your resources and everything that we've talked about, um, including the Burns Charities, because I think that's also extraordinary. And I know that you do work and continue to consult for people who've been affected by that. And that's a whole different area, isn't it? But it must be incredibly rewarding. And what an amazing job to actually you know, treat people from all walks of life and all stages of life and actually see them, you know, months after your work with, with long, glossy, flowing locks, which is just to so many means so much, doesn't it? Well, you know, a lot of people when I left Burns said, oh, you know, you used to do this really important job where you were saving lives. Don't you feel that what you're doing now is a bit frivolous? And my answer is categorically no. I know from the feedback I get from patients that I am changing their lives dramatically by restoring their hair. And the distress, you know, I do this all day, every day. The distress that I hear coming from people when they've lost their hair, both men and women, um, and being able to do something about that and give them their hair back is, is, is really a privilege. Brilliant. Well, it's a real privilege to have you here talking to us. Thank you so much. I look forward to talking again and to writing more about what you do online and really pointing a lot of people in your direction for the sound expert advice. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. And that is it for today's episode. What a fascinating, fascinating insight. And as always, you will find all the links and resources that Greg and I mentioned on today's show over on lizardwellbeing.com. There you can sign up for the free weekly newsletter that's filled with more ideas for happier, healthier living. And huge thanks to all of you who have left us such lovely reviews, especially on iTunes. You know, it really does help others to find the show. So big thanks from me and from the team. So until the next time we chat, go well. Bye-bye.
the Lizelle Wellbeing Show is presented by me, Lizelle, with production by Amaryllis Earl and Harry Trevithick at Heart Dialogue, with thanks to my producer, Ellie Smith, guest booker, Millie de la Morinière, and assistant researcher, Martha Comerford. <laughs>